Good morning. It is good to see you again. Uh, I'm so glad to be home. Uh, I'm, I'm glad to be with you today. It is good to be back. Let me ask you a question. If you were going to have a me day, what would you do? Like if you're going to have, you know what I mean, a me day? Have you ever heard that expression, someone say that? Uh, let, let, me, let me tell you about mine. Um, it would start a little bit later than normal. I'd just kind of wake up naturally about 8.30, maybe with the cool fall breeze blowing in an open window. There's some bird song in the old oak tree outside our bedroom window. And Deb would come in and kind of gently shake me and say, hey, honey, it's about 20 minutes. We're going to have breakfast. We're going to have your favorite. We're going to have breakfast skillets. So hash brown potatoes and scrambled eggs and sausage gravy and bacon and sourdough toast and orange juice and, and coffee. All right, this is a good day already, you know, and, and so after breakfast, I'd, you know, play video games with the kids for a while, and then, and then head into my favorite guitar store for a late morning jam session, you know, and, and I might find something that I just couldn't live without, and I'd, I'd buy it, and I'd bring it home, and she wouldn't even be mad. Um, <laughs> you can tell this is a fantasy, right? You know, so we'd come home and have, you know, chili dogs and chips and uh, ice cold Mountain Dew with the kids for lunch and then go out in the yard and just work in, you know, out in the yard, rake some leaves, get things ready for fall. And then we give our older girls, you know, some money and say, hey, take your brothers out for pizza and a movie and I'm going to take your mom out for a nice dinner and we're going to enjoy some time together. I don't know about you what your perfect me day is, but that sounds like a great me day to me. Like I, 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 would, I would vote for that. Um, we probably all had that thought occasionally, like, I could use a little me time. This might push on you a little bit, and I hope you wore your steel-toed boots today. But I think that idea is absolute junk. It's broken. It's useless. It's trash. And it belongs in the junkyard, the idea that we should be self-oriented in order to be content or fulfilled in this life is junk. We're nearing the end of our series called Junkyard Theology today. And over the last few weeks, we've been looking at ideas that people believe that are just wrong or, or useless. And the idea has been that if you get your theology in the junkyard, it, it won't work. I want you to have a theology that works. I want you to have a theology that makes sense and, and harmonizes your life with your experience. And so today's message is not about the most important bits of junk theology. Brandon might have covered that last week on, on the Jesus being the one way. But it is without question the most insidious. It is the most dangerous. It is the most seductive. I need some me time. That bit of junk theology would tell you that you need to take care of yourself first and foremost. The problem is the Bible never says that. Now, some of you might reference, well, what about when Jesus said, you know, love your neighbor as yourself? Isn't there some measure of self-love that's implied there? You can't love, you know, others if you don't love yourself first, right? Uh, hang on. You need to make sure you're not twisting Jesus' words to mean something he didn't mean. See, in, in Luke 10, 27, an expert in the law, who's, someone whose job it was to study these things, comes to Jesus, and he said, what's the greatest commandment? And here's how Jesus answered in Luke 10, 27. He answered, love the Lord your God with all your heart, and with all your soul, and with all your strength, and with all your mind, and love your neighbor as yourself. That verse is not a command to love yourself. It's not what he's saying. <laughs> if you're a parent, you, you know this. You don't have to give kids selfishness lessons. It just comes natural. In fact, you have to teach them the opposite, right? You need to share. <laughs> We're working on this with Ephraim, our youngest. He's five. Someone will do something nice for him. And Ephraim, do you want this? Yeah, no, yes, please, yes, please, okay. Right? We're having to train this into him, right? The, the, this idea of thinking through... <laughs> What, you know, being others oriented. This command in Luke 10, 27 is not a command to love yourself. It is a command to care for others with no less attention than you would care for yourself. Don't get that twisted. 
It's a command to be others focused, which derives in context from loving God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, loving God with everything you are. I need some me time is junk theology because it's self-oriented and self-referential rather than being God-oriented and God-dependent. Well, some of you might say, well, Casey, God commanded us to rest, and you're absolutely right. He did, and we should. Let me ask you this. On what day did, of, of creation did God create us, humankind? Which day? Day six. What did they do on day seven? Rest. Do you realize that the very first thing that human beings did when they were created was spend a day of rest with God? Wow. The very first thing before the, Adam began to tend the garden, before they began to fulfill God's command to, 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 to fill the earth and subdue it, they rested with him. Sabbath is good, it is right, but rest or Sabbath is not the same thing as me time. Rest and Sabbath is God-oriented. Me time is self-oriented. They cannot be the same thing. Now, listen, what I'm talking about today is the selfward orientation of our culture, and we all participate in this. I'll illustrate that in a little while from our experience over the last couple weeks. And I will tell you, sometimes the holiest thing you can do is take a nap and have a snack. Right? When Elijah was just, he felt like he had poured himself out in service of God, right? And, and he, he's just, he lays down in the desert and he just wants to die. And the angel comes to him and says, the, the journey is too much for you. Rest. Eat. Drink. And he wakes up and he says, it, you're not ready. He's ready to go. You're not ready yet. Eat. Drink. Rest. But that, you need to understand that was God directed. God, God commanded that. And it was God oriented. Because what's the purpose of that? Well, he's got to make it all the way to Sinai so he can have a pretty powerful encounter with God. Right? So, yes, sometimes the holiest thing you can do is take a nap and have a snack. But the difference between whether or not that Sabbath or me time is entirely dependent on the condition of your heart. If you're, and here, I say, how do I know, Casey? If you're ready to give it up at a moment's notice to go serve, it's Sabbath. If you're ready to lay, like, like you know, someone shakes you, hey, get up, we need, the Lord needs you. Okay. Like Samuel, remember in the middle of the night, Samuel, Samuel, what's he do? Hops up out of bed, yeah, you know, goes to Eli. Yes, you called me? It wasn't me. He gets it three times this happens. If you're willing to just, or, or leave the plate and go serve, okay, th then it's Sabbath. But if you're like, no, I'm staying put. No, I'm going to finish this cheeseburger. Like, whatever. Then uh, you're probably veering more toward me time. I, yeah. So maybe some of you have seen this, they're, they're, at certain hotels they have this little uh, door, tang, uh, door hanger, like, yeah, right? The do not disturb sign. It says, I saw this, I need some me time. Like, wow, okay, they're just putting it out there, aren't you? Right? Or, or maybe you're thinking, I want to, like, I need this sweater, look at this. Like, um, <laughs> that's, that is basically saying go away leave me alone right this is the ultimate me time sweater there's just enough of a hole right just enough to see what you're binging on netflix there's one that one handle for you could hold your you know beverage or whatever and i guess you had to i don't know what you do if you have to use the restroom anyway um i get it there are times that we feel like that okay sure but here's the thing charles krauthammer said this the reigning cliche of the day is that in order to love others, one must first learn to love oneself. This formulation, love thyself, then thy neighbor, is a license for unremitting self-indulgence. That is a great phrase. That is a powerful turn of phrase. There's a reason that guy was on TV for years. Unremitting self-indulgence because the quest for self-love is endless. So when I use the phrase me time today, I'm talking about a life that is frequently, if not constantly, oriented toward self. And that is different than Sabbath. 
Sabbath is oriented toward God. It is oriented toward his presence. Me time is oriented toward me and kicking God off the throne and sitting in his spot. And it's possible that your perceived need for me time is actually your soul telling you you need a deeper walk with God than you currently have. Listen, do not settle for me time when God is calling you to something deeper and more significant and more powerful. At the 2014 North American Christian Convention, which was in Orlando, Florida, right? The happiest place on earth. One of the main speakers, who also happens to be my dad, said this. Sometimes we like to satisfy ourselves with something less than God would give us. We keep eating cotton candy at the state fair of the spirit and wonder why we're still hungry. You like cotton candy? Okay. It just disappears in your mouth though, right? Like if you're hungry, it doesn't do much. If someone gave you a choice, what would you rather have? Cotton candy or a, a perfectly aged steak with a baked potato and some veggies and rolls. and Like, yeah, I picked that one. Every time. The thought that I need some me time, it, 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 that's what's creating that. It's, you're, you're craving cotton candy and God wants to give you so much more. And it, it just doesn't work. Me time just doesn't work. So how do we create a theology that works? If we take away your me time, what do we put in its place? I think we can put something far better in its place, more richer, more fulfilling. The good news is that Scripture provides not only something that works better, but is ultimately far more satisfying to your heart. And I think there are really two biblical perspectives that I want to put in front of you today that, that will ultimately crowd out and starve out the desire for me time. Okay? The first one can be found in Matthew 10, 37. Open your Bibles or your Bible apps to Matthew 10, 37. I'm so glad you're here today. God's been, che- I've been chewing on this one for a couple weeks now, and I'm eager to share it. So thanks for being here. For those watching online, thanks for logging in. Appreciate you doing that. I, I, what I want to do is kind of give a variation on a theme. We're not going to land in one text so much as we're going to look at several, but they, they, they continue to kind of keep playing into this idea And really, this is born out of having a couple weeks to serve God in Austria. If you're new here today, you may not know that for the last two weeks, my wife and I were at uh, Haus Edelweiss in Heiligenkreuz, Austria, about 40 minutes outside Vienna, serving with TCM. I had the opportunity to do a workshop uh, for European pastors and their wives. It's called Marriage and Ministry, uh, Building Long-Term Sustainability for Both. And I'll tell you a little bit more about that in a, in a while, but this really comes out of that experience that I had there. It was, it was work, yeah, but it was also a time of, uh, of worship and, and getting my fire for global evangelism refueled. I mean, there's, there's nothing like being in a, a group of people and worshiping in, all in different languages all right, they, the, they were, we were led by Romanian brothers and sisters, and so all the words on the screen were Romanian. And they were like, if you want to know, if you don't know the words by heart, Google it. I was like, okay. So we're holding up our phones, sing, you know, uh, making sure. It was awesome. And, and just being around that and hearing their stories and the, and the way that God worked. I mean, it was work, but it wasn't me time at all. It was refreshing. It was renewing. So if we take away your me time, what do we put in its place? Two perspectives. Here's the first one. Number one is Jesus' perspective. And Jesus' perspective is that what we need is death to self. Death to self. Jesus tells his disciples they have to die to themselves. Look with me at Matthew chapter 10, verse 37. This is, the, this is the passage where Jesus is commissioning the 12. He's sending them out to preach and teach and heal and, and do miracles. Right? And he, Jesus says, anyone who loves their father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. Anyone who loves their son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. Whoever does not take up their cross. Now let's pause right there. You need to understand that in the first century world, when you touched a cross, the the actual cross piece that the condemned criminal would carry, the moment you touched it, you're dead. You pick that up, you're a dead man. And the disciples knew this. This was not a metaphor for Jesus. This was literal, and some of them experienced it literally. Literally. Peter, according to Fox's Book of Martyrs, was forced to watch his wife be crucified and then was crucified upside down because he refused to die in the same manner as his Lord. 
Some of them, hearing Jesus say this, experience this literally in their own life. Jesus says, whoever does not take up their cross and follow me is not worthy of me. Whoever finds their life will lose it, and whoever loses their life for my sake will find it. Listen, when Jesus says, take up your cross, he's not talking about putting up with a difficult person. Or, or bearing a burden, right? Or dealing with your obnoxious boss. Sometimes we'll use that phrase and we use it far too lightly. Well, it's just my cross to bear. Oh, for crying out loud, you got delayed in traffic. That is not the same thing. Jesus is, is not talking about that. He, he's, he's talking about laying everything you are at the foot of the cross in surrender. He's talking about living with your yes on the table, right? If Jesus were to appear to you in the flesh and make some request of you, what is your answer? Yes, immediately, unhesitatingly, yes. If Jesus were to walk into your dining room and say, I need you to fill in the blank, your answer as a Christian is, yes, of course, Lord. Automatically, that's what, he's, that's what take, you know, taking up your cross means. It means abandoning your claim on your own life. Because that's exactly what Jesus did, didn't he? He left glory. He left honor. And he came here with us. He lived in total submission to the Father. I like how the Cotton Patch Version translates verse 39. The person who hoards his life. You've seen hoarders on TV? The person who hoards his life throws it away and the one who abandons his life for my cause discovers it. What I'm saying is this. If yourself has been crucified, you don't need me time. Jesus' point in Matthew 10 is that we're to choose him over everything else. Physical desires, family, relationships, material things, social status. Now here's the thing. Jesus actually says this twice in Matthew's gospel. He says it here in Matthew 10. He also says it again in Matthew 16. Now here he's sending out the 12. The context in Matthew 16 is Jesus saying, who do men say that I am? And Peter makes this great confession, you are the Christ, the Son of God. Right? And it's awesome. And Jesus says, I'm going to have to go to Jerusalem and suffer and die. And Peter, what's he say? No, Lord. (laughs) If I had a dollar for every time that guy told Jesus no. No, Lord. And what's, how's, how's Jesus respond? Get behind me. Get behind me, Satan. I mean, that's, so like, like in just five verses or something. It, it's this really short thing where Peter makes this, this great confession and then just a few verses later, <laughs> both times, both times Jesus says this, there is some connotation of reward. There's this idea that that there, there's something out there, if you're willing to give up me time, if you're willing to give up your own claim on your life, that God has something really amazing out there for you. You really get to live. But this is about more than just delayed gratification or deferred payment. It is about choosing what is better by far over what is simply good. Now, here's the thing. Nothing I mentioned in my perfect me day is, is bad. Maybe buying an expensive guitar without talking to my wife. But other than that... Nothing is bad. It's not immoral. It's not wrong. It's just self-oriented. The problem is when we become consumed with pursuing our wants and our own pleasure. Joy Davidman, a brilliant woman in her own right, who also happened to be married to C.S. Lewis, said this, living for his own pleasure is the least pleasurable thing a man can do. If his neighbors don't kill him in disgust, he'll die slowly of boredom and lovelessness. And in his classic work, The Cost of Discipleship, Dietrich Bonhoeffer famously said, when Christ calls a man, he bids him come and die. Jesus' perspective is that we need to die to ourselves. How do we do that? Well, that's exactly what he told the expert in the law to do. The way he answered, what, what what is the greatest commandment, essentially is asking, what does God want from me? And so Jesus told him, this is, you death yourself. What does that mean? It means, first of all, you love God with everything you are. Heart, soul, mind, strength. This is what we encourage you to say every Sunday at the conclusion of our service. 
If you're new here, we offer a benediction, and it's just a reminder of our mission. It's a reminder of what we're to be about. We say this thing together as just as a final blessing on, on, before, on you before you leave. But we say, right, I, I, we bring our brokenness to Jesus. What is that? You're, you're literally kneeling at the foot of the cross, and you're placing everything you are at Jesus' disposal. You're saying, everything I am, Lord, it's yours here. Here. We, bringing your brokenness to Jesus means you, you relinquish your claim on you. You say, okay, Jesus, you're, you're the boss. You run things. It means, so that's loving God with everything you are, heart, soul, mind, strength, but it also means loving others with everything you have. That everything God has put in your life, whatever, that, whatever resources you've got, it's relinquishing your claim on them. They, they were Jesus's resources. You know, your, your, your time, your wealth, your skills, your influence. Again, that's what makes the difference between Sabbath and me time, right? If I'm going to clang on to it, it's me time. But if I'm going to hold it loosely in an open hand with what you give, with how you live, then, yeah, that's loving others with everything you have. All the resources God has put in you at, the, at a moment's notice to go, here, Lord, it's yours. Okay, Jesus, here. And you just let go of it because it's not even yours anyway. I realize that can sound pretty heavy. That can sound pretty heavy-handed. But that's only part of rejecting the junk theology of me time. Because not only do we need Jesus' perspective, I think we also need Paul's perspective. And Paul's perspective is that we need to live for Jesus. So the, the, the Jesus' perspective is we die to ourselves. Paul's perspective is we live for Jesus. And you can see that in Philippians 1.21 and its context. So turn over to Philippians chapter 1, verse 21. See, for Jesus, the proper disposition, disposition of the disciple is total surrender of his or her life to the death of Jesus. And we say this when we baptize somebody, right? You're buried with Christ. What's that mean? You're dead, but resurrected in him, that Jesus raises up a new one. And then what happens? You live your life for Jesus. Your life becomes focused on him. This is what Paul says in Philippians 1.21, right? For to me, to live is Christ. And to die is gain. I orient my whole life around who Jesus is, and then when I finally die, it just gets better. Paul is echoing, I think, to some extent, the words of John the Baptist in John 3.30, right? John the Baptist, in pointing to Jesus as the Lamb of God, the, the Messiah who takes away the sin of the world, says, he must increase, I must decrease. To put it even more simply, more Jesus, less me. That'd be a good bumper sticker, wouldn't it? More Jesus, less me. If you get a bumper sticker like that, please drive responsibly. Okay? <laughs> you give Jesus a bad name and you're driving. More Jesus, less me. It, it's important, I think, though, that we not take Paul's comment out of context. Because all the way up to this point, he had been letting the Philippian church know about how much he'd suffered for the gospel. And, and don't, don't get this twisted, right? We, we say, more Jesus, less me. We say, I want to live for Christ and to live as Christ and to die as gain. And there's this temptation, especially in America in the 21st century, to think that that's about unmitigated success and blessing. Nope. Look at the context in which Paul gives it. He'd been talking about being in chains as a prisoner. He literally did time for Jesus. He'd had to deal with adversaries and rival preachers, false believers who made trouble for him, who saw that by preaching the name of Jesus, they could find a quick payday. And yet through all that, he realized his total focus was on living the life of Jesus, and that was actually being effective. The whole palace had heard the good news about Jesus, right? Other Christians were preaching boldly in the name of Christ. Paul was trusting that God would save him and that God would give, be given glory because of his life. And so when Paul writes, to live is Christ, he's defining the totality of his existence by living Jesus' life within the context of his own life. And I can't think of a more polar opposite to me time than that. So Casey, how, how, how do I do that? How do I live out more Jesus, less me? How do I live out to live as Christ, to die as gain? And here's the question that I think you, you need to wrestle with in your own life, because I can't answer it for you. If we had a conversation, I might be able to suggest some things, but I can't answer this for you. What I can do is give you the right self-evaluation question, and here it is. How would Jesus live his life if he woke up in my body tomorrow morning? 
How would Jesus conduct himself if he woke up in my body? Other than healing my, this knee that's been giving me some trouble, right? Like, initially, yeah, like, shoo, um, but how, how would he love Debbie? How would he love my children? How would he serve as a pastor at Chapel Rock Christian Church? How would he live as a neighbor in Chapel Hill neighborhood? Wrestle with this. Write that down. How would Jesus live my, if he woke up in my body tomorrow, what would he do? There's your answer to what does it mean for the question, how do I live like Jesus? More Jesus, less me. There, There you go. See, not only that, but it's in Philippians that Paul says that all of the things that his Jewish culture held up as valuable, he said belonged in the junkyard or landfill or septic tank. He says all those things in chapter 3, verses 4 through 11, that his culture held up as wonderful and great and blessings. Paul says all of them are, insert your favorite word for poop, It's translated rubbish, and I think that's because the NIV doesn't want to potentially offend somebody. But you just stick in whatever word you think of, and if it's one that you're like, sometimes I think it, but I don't feel right saying it, that's probably the right word. Because it's intentionally designed to press on you. Paul says all of that is trash. It's all rubbish. It's garbage. Belongs in the landfill. And he said, I would give up all of that in a heartbeat to live like Jesus. In Philippians chapter 4, verse 11, Paul says that he has learned to be content in every circumstance. How do you do that? He lives for Christ. His life is oriented toward Jesus. Here's what I'm telling you. When you live for Jesus, your sense of contentment is so much better than a perfect me time kind of day. Did you notice when I described my perfect me day, there was no mention of God anywhere in that? I'm a pastor. How messed up is that? Here's the thing. When we're totally focused on ourselves, getting all the me time we can, God becomes increasingly more and more optional until he just fades out of the picture. Do you know anyone who has done that over the last three years? Do you know anyone who has just made God increasingly less of an important factor in their life until it's just not a factor? I do. That's junk. It's garbage. And it sneaks in so subtly that if you don't have someone occasionally step on your toes and warn you about it, you might not realize you're doing it. So how do we fight this? Let me give you two strategies. First of all, you're going to need less me time when you have the joy of the Lord. Now, I get it. I understand. That sounds like a really churchy answer. Like, well, of course the preacher's going to say you need the joy of the Lord. Duh. What does that come from? It comes from your inner life, your, your walk with the Lord, your prayer life. And it comes from the Word. Remember, Paul is writing to the Philippian church. Do you remember what happened in Philippi? Acts 16? Paul and Silas take a beating in the name of Jesus. They're put in prison. They spend the night with broken, bleeding backs, cut to ribbons by this cat of nine tails, with their feet splayed out wide in the stocks, in incredible discomfort. What are they doing? They're worshiping. They're singing. They're praising God so much so that the other prisoners are listening to this. And when an earthquake comes and opens the doors, they don't run away because they want to hang out with Paul. Like, what does that guy have that I am missing? What does he have? He has the joy of the Lord. He has, listen, joy is not the same as happiness. Don't get those confused in your head. Happiness can be, you know, a, a, a new puppy or your favorite meal or whatever. That's different than joy. Joy doesn't matter what your circumstances are. It comes out of your inner walk with God and the confidence that one day all things that are blessed will be restored to you. That you'll live forever in the presence of God and you'll see his face and live and not die. You don't need me time when you got that. That's better. It's just better. 
Secondly, you're going to need less me time when your main concern is the glory of God. If your main concern is the comfort of you, you're never going to know this kind of peace and joy that comes, ever. But if your main concern is the glory of God, again, if Jesus woke up in my body, how would he live his life, right? Jesus' main concern was the glory of the Father. I brought glory to your name. And sometimes he even acknowledged that in his prayers. He said, Lord, I didn't pray this so that they they would hear. I prayed it so I could glorify your name. You're going to need less me time when your main concern is the glory of God. Our desire for me time, I think, is, is fundamentally a rejection of being content in the situation where God has put us. Me time is a rejection of contentedness. It's a lack of, as Brother Lawrence said, practicing the presence of God. And I experienced that over the last couple weeks. We spent time at House Edelweiss in Austria. It is a beautiful place. It, is, it, it has become, this is my third visit, it's become restored it for me and this is so this is the environment that we're walking around let me show you some pictures right there's the main house um just this was sunday morning there there it is you can see that i got to climb that mountain one day um it's just a beautiful beautiful place on the second story uh there's a there's a professor's lounge and so for those who teach it's kind of a quiet spot to get away and prepare for the next day and i would be up there in the afternoon this was my view out the window like that let's just all acknowledge that doesn't stink Okay, that's pretty cool. Um, But we had a COVID breakout. Now, Debbie and I tested. We're negative. We're good to be here. Don't worry. We had a COVID breakout while we were there. And about half of our short-term workers and quite a few of the staff had to be in isolation. They got sick. One of our short-term workers even went to the hospital. COVID pneumonia. It was bad. And so this team that had come together over a, a few days by Sunday afternoon, they're dropping like flies. And, and everybody had to step up. And I want to publicly praise Rob Deiniger and Dan and Dorota Laskowski, who were just warriors, man. They just stepped into it and serving. And it was awesome to watch them uh, serve that way. My wife just jumped into the kitchen because that's who she is, right? And, and Uh, It was just, it was awesome to see God do that. And I'm sitting here every afternoon going, okay, how many of our students are we going to have? Not one student got sick. We were able to adapt. We had people in our our group from um, Ukraine and Bulgaria and Romania and Italy and Moldova and Belarus. So multiple languages going on there at times. It, it, was, it was powerful. And I don't know if you've ever had a conversation with someone where they have to use translation. It is mentally exhausting. If you've ever done that, because you're like, I don't, who do I look at? Do I look at the person who, who, who said the thing and now it's being translated? Or do I look at the translator? And both Debbie and I would go back in the afternoon and we'd be like, why does our forehead hurt? Because you're communicating everything with your eyes. Right? I I can't, I don't speak Russian. I can say yes, no, and thank you in Russian. That's it. That's all I got. So you're trying to communicate with your eyes, and you're being very intentional about your body language, and it, it should have been exhausting. Wasn't tired. Wasn't tired. It should have been utterly draining, and I should have gone back to our room and stared at the wall for 20 minutes just trying to figure out what just happened didn't happen. Why? Because God is very slowly teaching me, I don't need me time when I have the joy of the Lord. I don't need me time if I'm focused on his glory. Here's what I want you to grab this morning. The presence of God expressed through experiencing the joy of the Lord and being focused on his glory will always starve out the narcissism in our lives. There is no room for me time when you are focused on the joy of the Lord and his glory. And the blessing you will receive from that is so much better than a me time kind of day. 
Jesus will eliminate that need for you. It will eliminate that desire in you because you will know a contentment that you've never experienced before. Did you hear me today? Here's our big idea this morning. Real life doesn't come through me time. It comes through selflessness and being Jesus-oriented. That's where life is. So reject the lie of our culture that you need me time and embrace the kind of life that Jesus has for you today. Now listen, I want you to respond to this message. And so I played around with a couple different ideas of how we could creatively engage this from writing something on a prayer wall or putting a bookmark in your Bible or, you know, we played around with different stuff. When it comes down to it, the only real response to this message today is for you to go to the cross, to point to the cross of Christ And so we're going to end with communion. In a little bit, I'm going to pray, and you'll be dismissed to go to several stations around the room. We've got two up front. So if you come to one of these that's got a lid on it, you want to take that off. Start at the outside edge and work your way in. Try real hard not to touch anybody else's cup if you can. Okay? For those of you in the balcony, there are stairs on the side. You can come down. There are also two stations under the stairs and a couple out in the lobby. Just go to whichever one's closest. But I'm going to ask you to do this spiritual exercise as we do this today. Okay? Shut your eyes. Just go ahead and shut your eyes right real quick. If if you're listening to this right now, you're you're sitting in a comfortable pew in a climate control room. And in just a second, when you get up to go to these stations where we'll take communion, I, I want you to visualize the seat that you're sitting in representing your selfishness representing self-orientation. And maybe for some of you that's a little, and maybe for some of you that's a lot, I don't know. But I want you to imagine your seat kind of representing your life that's focused on self. And as you get up out of it, at which point you definitely need to open your eyes, you get up out of it and you go to one of these communion stations and you take the bread that represents Jesus' body and you take the juice that represents his blood that was shed for you on the cross in your place for the forgiveness of sin so that you can be set free from sin and self. I want you to see yourself laying your selfishness at the foot of the cross, relinquishing it. And as you take those emblems back to your seat to partake in your own time, I want you to imagine you're going back to your life now with a renewed focus on Jesus and on his glory and a decreasing and and disappearing focus on your own selfishness and self-orientation. You go back to your life and you go back to your seat with a renewed focus on Jesus. And you partake in your own time. And we're gonna sing together even as we move, the the band will be leading us and I would encourage you to sing as you're waiting in line or, or whatever. Just move to the closest one near you and partake in that and leave your selfishness behind and go to the cross and then come back to your life renewed and refocused on Jesus. Even in the garden, he prayed, not my will, but yours be done. And maybe that can be your prayer as you come forward, as you wait in line. It's just not my will, but yours be done. Not my will, but yours be done. Not my will, but yours be done. He prayed that three times. Jesus, we come to you today acknowledging our selfishness, acknowledging our selfward orientation of our culture and knowing, Lord, that you have a much richer, much better, deeper life for us out there if we will just live it. Help us, Lord, to do that. As we come to you, as we come to the cross, Jesus, we thank you for your shed blood when you died on the cross in our place for our sins and rose again so that we could lay down our lives and surrender to you and receive so much more. We thank you for that promise. We rejoice in it, Lord, and we we take this memorial until we look forward to taking it with you in heaven one day. We love you, Jesus. It's in your name we pray.